What if you could get up in the morning, every morning, look into the mirror and say, there is nothing wrong with me? You know, how would you uh, live your life differently? Uh, how productive would you be? How happy would you be? How much joy and contentment? How much confidence would you have? If you knew there was nothing wrong with me or with you. Now, I think a lot of people would say, well, okay, yeah, I understand when I'm born into the family of God, physically, you know, mentally, uh, emotionally, spiritually, sinless, then I can say, then and only then can I say that there is nothing wrong with me. The problem is, in facing that, you know, either Christ has to return or you have to expire before that you can actually do that. And, and you know, I understand that when a perfection will occur, but Living your life in a state of mind where you are always dwelling on what's wrong with you is a terrible way to live out the rest of your life. Absolutely terrible. Even if you have physical things wrong with you, and I understand that. I mean, I, I, I can sympathize with, with anyone who has, uh, you know, I mean, I have a left bundle branch block, which is a heart condition. Chris has a heart condition. You know, you may have aches and pains and things that, I think about Jeff over here, the things that he goes through. And um, so there's, there's all kinds of things physically, on the physical level, aches and pains that we can have that I understand, you know, where, where, where you're coming from with that. But it's still a ter even even with those aches and pains and suffering, it's still a terrible way to live out the rest of your life thinking there is something waking up every day thinking there is something wrong with me. In Mark 12 and verse 33, you don't have to turn there, but it's a little statement you're familiar with. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than a whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. We are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, it's hard to love your neighbor if you don't like yourself. <laughs> you know, we, we, there, there, there's a connection there, okay? People that have a hard time loving themselves believe more than they believe in the air that they breathe that there is something wrong with me. How much time, how much creative energy do we spend thinking about what's wrong with me? William Backus, in his book, 200 uh, Truth Talks, says the average person tells himself 200 lies a day. You know, I'm fat, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I, I talk too much, I don't talk enough, or, you know, it just goes on and on and on and on. 200 lies a day. And I can guarantee you that most of those lies, if not all of those lies, revolve around, you guessed it, What's wrong with me? Mark de Jesus said that if we talk to a child or if we talk to our own children the way that we talk to ourselves, the police would come by and haul us off for child abuse. <laughs> Think about that. Now in Romans 8 and verse 1, it tells us, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Otherwise, when I look at that, I sort of get some encouragement here. Encouragement is, maybe there's nothing wrong with me. Maybe, just maybe, there's nothing wrong with me. Because there is no condemnation. A woman came to a psychiatrist she had been a smoker for 15 years and she wanted desperately to quit she had tried everything she had tried the patches that you know put on your arms or whatever she had tried hypnosis and after she went to that session said she, she got back in her car and lit up a cigarette and went home <laughs> 
And she was just beating herself up. She said, you know, I, I am a terrible, 15 years, I cannot quit this addiction. I am a terrible person. I, I hate myself. I, I, I condemn myself for, every time I light up, I condemn myself. And, and that went on for about 15 minutes. And then the psychiatrist said, stop it. Stop it. He said, here's what I want you to do. He said, for every time you have a desire to smoke, light up. If you need to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, just every time that desire hits you, light up a cigarette. Smoke all the cigarettes you want to smoke. But there's one stipulation. When you light up, you cannot condemn yourself for doing so. You cannot criticize yourself for doing so. No condemnation. And five days later, she came back and said she was, had been freed from that smoking addiction. Now, now, what's my point? Is my point to indulge in sin every time you got a temptation? No, that's not my point. But on the other side of the coin, there is the power of God's grace. There is now no condemnation. No condemnation. And I think we can relate to that. I think a lot of us can relate to that. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Do we walk in the Spirit perfect every day? No, of course not. But there is nothing because of God's grace, because of God's forgiveness. There is nothing wrong with you. The power of the mind, the power of the mind, the power of what we think about. There was a study that tested the effects of, actual, of an actual surgery versus a fake surgery. Now get this. Uh, the study was conducted by Dr. Moses. Uh, it was a randomized double-blind placebo controlled clinical trial published in one of the most highly respected medical journal, journals in the world. Determined to prove the effectiveness of his surgery, he conducted an experiment. Group one received a real knee surgery. Group two received a fake knee surgery, a surgery where patients were taken to the operating room and shown a video of someone else's surgery while the surgeon pretended to operate. Now, I imagine that you're lying there and there's a sheet from your waist up, but there's monitors, and they were showing a video of someone else's knee surgery. Now, why you'd want to watch that is beyond me. I couldn't watch it without passing out, I don't think, so I wouldn't want to see the monitor. But, but it was, it was, it was a, a surgery, a video of someone else's sur surgery knee surgery. And I imagine the doctor would probe and prod and move the knee around and all that just like, and they thought they were getting a real knee surgery. Here are the results. One third of the patients who got the real surgery experienced resolution of their knee pain. Another one third of the patients who got the fake surgery also experienced resolution of their knee pain. The patients who got the fake knee surgery reported less knee pain immediately following the procedure. One of the fake surgeries uh, patients even stated, the surgery was two years ago and the knee has never bothered me since. It's just like my other knee now. How astonishing is this? I mean, th this shows just how powerful our beliefs can be. Now think about the beliefs that you hold. Think about the 200 lies that you're telling yourself a day. What do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about your future? Your belief will become your reality whether you want it or not, whether you're aware of your beliefs or not. You will act out that belief as though it was true even though it might be a complete lie that you're telling yourself. I always like that verse in um, Numbers 13, verse 33, and it says in, they were going into the promised land, I believe, or, or, or scouting it out. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which was come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. The power of the mind, how we view ourselves is how others will view us. Now, why are we so critical in condemning condemnation 
towards ourselves sometimes. Why? Why are we like that? Why do we tell ourselves 200 lies a day knowing, probably knowing that 99% of them, if not all of them, are lies that we are telling ourselves? Why do we speak to ourselves in such a way but we would never speak to a child or our own children that way. Why? Well, I have a theory, and I don't know if the theory is, is true or not. It, it, it's, 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 it's at least 50% true in my own life, so that makes it 50% true, I guess, this theory that I have. So here's the theory. It's the golden rule, and as you would like men to do to you, do ye also likewise to them. If you are critical condescending, have a condescending spirit toward others, this may be the reason you have a spirit of condemnation going on in your own life. Just a thought. Just a theory. You know, sometimes we, and I've gotten into this in, in, in doing outreach in my program, is that really in the Bible? Sometimes we love to tell people that they are wrong. I'm right, and you are wrong. <laughs> and here's the sad part it, it, it's not about hope that you can change and receive the spirit of God it's not about you know, hope that you will be converted it's not about I hope you'll be in God's kingdom it's not a, about I hope that you're one of the first fruits and that you will be there I just like telling people that they're wrong you know? you're right I'm wrong and I, I'm convinced there's two sides to the carnal mind. I used to think there's, there's one side to the carnal mind. The one side, the two sides, uh, the one side here is the one we're all familiar with, Romans 8 and verse 7. You don't have to turn there. But because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, I agree. One side of the carnal mind is, is, is what you hear today a lot of, a no-law theology you know, the law's been abolished, been nailed to the cross, been fulfilled, been, been, been done away with. Okay, that's, that's part of the carnal mind that we all like to identify with other people. But the other side of the same coin, maybe, of the carnal mind is people that just love to tell others how wrong they are. <laughs> you ever thought about that? That that could also be uh, another side of the carnal mind? I'm right and you're wrong. And to have this hostility this condescending spirit, this condemning spirit that reflects off that mirror right back at us. So this may be the reason you have a spirit of condemnation going on in your own life that just simply ref reflects back at you. <clears throat> the old saying, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. <laughs> And I'm not saying that we shouldn't evangelize. I do that. But, you know, not everybody is called to evangelize. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't speak the truth. But it's a really a matter of our attitude when it comes down. What is our attitude when we speak the truth towards others? What are we wanting? What are we desiring? Do we truly want that person? You know, that I, want, I, I love that person. And yeah, I got to do some some prodding and you know pinching and to get them to think and and but but I want them in God's kingdom. I want I want God to call them. <clears throat> so again, the theory is if you are critical, condescending, have a condescending spirit toward others, this may be the reason you have a spirit of co uh, condemnation going on in your own life. That was the theory. Now. Why do we often not get along with other Christians that believe differently than we do? Well, because they're wrong. No, I just kidding. <laughs> what, what, you know, that, all right, something come home to me recently. Well, I'll just sort of digress a little bit and tell about uh, uh, something that, uh, I, recently, I did Esther Wheelie's funeral service, and uh, I was talking to Janie, and she said, I don't want you to be too preachy. And I thought, I wonder what that means. Uh, <laughs> and she said, her brother Wallace told her, she said, Janie, we know what you believe. We know what you believe. And I used to think, mistakenly, 
that uh, you know a funeral was a place to bring out our differences. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell them everything this person believed. You know, about this, about that. And I, I no longer agree with that. I, I think a funeral should be a place where we comfort, you know, each other and comfort the people who are out there grieving not to bring out our differences. Uh, uh, that's the, so if you ask me to preach a sermon, uh, a funeral, don't ask me to preach about your differences, okay? Uh, <laughs> but what her brother Wallace said, Janie, we know what, what you believe. You know, the truth of the matter is, your family members, your friends, your relatives, chances are they know, they know what you believe. They know, they see you going off and keeping the Sabbath day. They know what you believe about the holidays and that you keep and, and some of the pagan holidays. They, they, they know what you believe. Here's the thing, they just don't agree with you. And that just irks us to death. I mean, it gets under our skin, you know? And we're dealing with the subject of why we don't get along with other Christians. It's, it's like, I dare you not to agree with me. I can't believe you don't agree with me. It just, it just bothers us. You know, it just bothers us. I do want to turn to this, brother, because I think it's, it sort of tells us how we should deal with Christian brothers that may believe differently than we do. Romans 14 and verse 7. Romans 14 and verse 7. Romans 14 and verse 7, For none of us live to himself, and no man dies to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this, to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord of both the living, of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you set at naught your brother, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That's a powerful scripture. You know, I, I feel in my convictions, I, I'm ready to give an account as to, to why I do the things that I do. I think, I, you know, I, I, can, I can prove them from the Bible, but that's also true of other people who claim the name of Christ. You know, they, they, uh, they have their convictions. They have their convictions that I think, uh, you know, should be respected. Now, how does all of this tie into the days of unleavened bread? Well, I've been trying to figure that out ever since I got up here. But uh, uh, <clears throat> what, what should have taken, it's either 11 or 14 days, took 40 years. I'm talking about the journey of the children of Israel through the wilderness. You know, if they would have just took the straight shot, it, would took, it was either 11 or 14 days. But God took them around the mulberry bush 40 years. Imagine that. <laughs> but they brought out of Egypt, the children of Israel, a lot of lies. And in the wilderness, boy, did they have their struggles there, murmuring, complaining against God. I mean, they had all kinds. I mean, if you think about, okay, 200 lies a day, 200 lies a day times 40 years, man, that's a lot of lies to tell yourself over, over a 40-year period. I mean, that's, that's just up. That's, that's pretty bad. But what if there was nothing wrong with you? Now, obviously, God corrects his children, and that just means God loves you enough to change you. But I do believe, and I've struggled with this, you know, something, um, sometimes we have what is called body scanning. We scan our bodies for, you know, we get up and we think, okay, uh, oops, I got a headache. Oops, my heart skipped a beat. Oops, I got this, I got that. And we scan our bodies and we, and we think, what's wrong with me? Got to be something wrong. It must be something wrong with me. And we face the day. We start out the day on the wrong foot thinking, must be something wrong with me. And I think there's a spiritual scanning also that we can do. Where, you know, well, I've sinned. Okay. Will God forgive me? You know, I... I, uh, you know, there's spiritual things that we struggle with, spiritual aspects of our lives that where we, we uh, come up short and we do this scanning and we think there must be something wrong with me. Must be something wrong with me. Got to be something wrong with me. Well, there is therefore now no condemnation 
to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So what if you could get up in the morning, look in the mirror, and say, there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you. Try it. Try it just for one day. By the grace of God. By the goodness of God. By the forgiveness of God. There is nothing wrong with me. It could change your life. 